welcome to this year's Global Forum on Health Promotion. My name is Bernard Kadassia, and I'm the president of the Alliance for Health Promotion. The Alliance for Health Promotion is the main organizer of the Global Forum on Health Promotion. It is um, remarkable that this year we are still able to hold the forum, considering the uh, tremendous challenges and numerous uncertainties that uh, COVID-19 has thrown upon the world. Therefore, I should start by thanking all of you for your contributions in preparing preparations for this forum and also for really making time uh, to participate today. I also want to thank our main uh, co-organizers for this forum, the Canadian Society for International Health. I want to thank our Canadian member organizations for their lands under the leadership of Health Nexus. I want to thank our long-standing uh, partners, the WHO, the Alliance member organizations, and a group of um, friends, experts, intellectuals that have year in, year out uh, supported the forum. Um, this year, uh, the forum is organized as a component or conjunction in conjunction with the Canadian uh, Conference on Global Health. The theme for the Canadian Conference on Global Health is climate change. What we would like to do within the forum is to look at that in a, a more flexible and broad way and look at the change that is taking place in the social, economic, commercial, uh, and even political, as well as physical and chemical environment uh, as determinants of health. This edition of the forum is uh, therefore going to look at those changes and to bring in our experiences as well as ideas and even new evidence from diverse sources to see how uh, going forward we can work towards a more uh, health secure future building on the environment that exists at this point i think it is pertinent for me to point out that over the last two or three years i must say uh, beginning with the un general assembly uh, on social uh, determinants of health but also on the sustainable development goals and agenda 2030 the environment has become very supportive for health and and well-being it is therefore our objective uh, at this forum to see how we can build on that supportive policy and, and programmatic environment to come up with ideas to come up with agenda to come up with the recommendations that can contribute to a more health uh, secure future using uh, health promotion and, and well-being as a, a platform in terms of uh, deliverables uh, what we shall try to get out of the forum is an outcome document that we can then build into the outcome document for the whole conference and then use that as a basis for input into forthcoming initiatives in global health and, and the development. And I know I have a, an idea, a number of this uh, are coming up uh, quite soon. So uh, we have before us a strong lineup of speakers, interviewers, discussants, uh, and of course, your participants. And I'm looking forward to uh, a very successful uh, forum on health promotion. So without taking more time, I invite you to go right in and enjoy 
the forum this year. Thank you. Hello, my name is Wendy Catherine and I'm the executive director of Health Nexus, a health promotion and population health education organization in Canada. I'm pleased to welcome you to the 10th Global Forum on Health Promotion, sponsored by the Alliance for Health Promotion, with the support of our partners at the Canadian Society of International Health and Health Nexus. In conjunction with the Alliance, Health Nexus is proud and we are fortunate today to present an engaging slate of speakers, starting with an opening by Director General Dr. Tedros Ghebreyesus, followed by an interview with Ilona Kickbush and Dr. Rudiker Krak, Director of the Department of Health Promotion at the World Health Organization. Cue video, please. Mr. Bernard Kadasia, President of the Alliance for Health Promotion, distinguished guests, dear colleagues and friends. Good morning, good afternoon and good evening. And thank you for the opportunity of sharing a few reflections with you today. The COVID-19 pandemic has affected us all. Lives and livelihoods have been lost. The global economy is in recession and geopolitical fault lines have been deepened. The pandemic has underlined the critical importance of trust and communication between institutions and the public. All the measures the governments put in place to respond to COVID-19, physical distancing, hand hygiene, quarantine, wearing masks and more, succeed or fail based on the extent to which communities are engaged and empowered to protect themselves and others. Both the virus itself and the response to it in terms of stay-at-home orders and other so-called lockdown restrictions have exacerbated the poverty and inequality that are the drivers of many diseases. This is not a crisis that can be solved by governments alone or UN agencies alone. It takes a whole of society response with engaged and empowered communities at the center. Civil society organizations play a vital role in empowering communities and ensuring the needs of the most vulnerable groups are met. COVID-19 has shown that we cannot just wait for the next pandemic to strike we must focus on preparedness and prevention. In the same way, treating diseases is vital, but WHO is calling on all countries to make better use of proven measures to promote health, prevent disease, and unlock resources in care. To do that, we need a whole of government and whole of society approach to addressing the reasons people get sick and die in the air we breathe, the food we eat, the water we drink, and the conditions in which we live and work. And we can only do that with a One Health approach that recognizes the intimate links between the health of humans, animals, and our planet. WHO has made fostering healthy populations one of our highest priorities. But we can only achieve our goals with your support. That's why I agreed to set up a working group on health and well being involving leading civil society organizations engaged in health promotion. I expect the working group to meet soon and to advance its work rapidly. There is no time to lose. Promoting health isn't just the right thing to do. It's the smart thing to do. When we promote and protect health, 
we also promote and protect jobs, businesses, economies, education, gender equality, peace, sustainability, and more. In the end, COVID-19 is a reminder that life is fragile. Health is the most precious commodity on earth. And that for everything that is different, we are one humanity. We have no other option but to work together for a healthier, safer, fairer, and more sustainable world. I thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to the participants of the Canadian Conference on Global Health and the 10th Forum, 10th Global Forum on Health Promotion. So this meeting is aimed at uh, global health professionals and also host civil health promotion activists. So today's interview takes place at the invitation of the Alliance for Health Promotion, an NGO based in Geneva. And our guest is Professor Ilona Kitbush. We aim to explore with her how far we have come from the Ottawa Charter and what are the current challenges of health promotion. So we'll start by introducing ourselves. I am Veronica Shiroya from Kenya originally, and I'm an international uh, public health practitioner and researcher and currently a doctorate candidate at the Heidelberg Institute of Global Health, uh, University of Heidelberg in Germany. Uh, good morning. My name is uh, Mihai Kirkin. I am helping Veronica to make this interview. So I'm a co-reporter. I'm Hungarian, a medical doctor, a former politician. At the moment, I work as a lecturer at various universities and I'm also a consultant at the World Health Organization. So uh, the global health community knows Professor Kikush quite well, but let me just greet her as the key creator of uh, the health promotion concept, who's had a distinguished career at the WHO at the Yale University. And she's also the founder and chair of the Global Health Center at the Graduate Institute of International and development studies in Geneva. Her interest includes the political determinant of health, health in all policies, health diplomacy, and global health. Uh, but let me go ahead with the first uh, question. Ilona, four years ago in Shanghai, in your closing remarks at the ninth global conference uh, on health promotion, you made it clear that health promotion has become a political and global issue. And in fact, uh, health promotion appears in high level documents such as the UN Declaration on Universal Health Coverage last year and some others. Uh, could you make this approach tangible for us? Well, thank you, Mihaly, and uh, thank you, Veronica, and I'm delighted uh, to be part of this conversation. Uh, hello to everybody who is watching. To come to your question, uh, Mihaly, I think there's a, a difference uh, if one looks at uh, the progress achieved uh, in health promotion as a discipline, uh, health promotion as an approach, you know, the five areas of the Ottawa Charter, and we'll come back to those, and health promotion as a mind frame. Remember, the subtitle of the Ottawa Charter was towards a new public health, and the key message really was one of empowerment, empowering people, empowering communities, and I think rarely in global health and public health has that message of empowerment been as strong as it presently is. Just also think of the feminist contributions to health promotion and global health, the decolonization movement in global health. So this message of empowerment on the one hand, the other key message was that health is a resource. 
uh, a resource for everyday life and uh, initially maybe that resource source discussion was a bit too economic you know we took this notion of investment in health uh took that forward very much but i think now and again i come to health promotion as a mind frame if we look at the sdgs if we look at sdg3 which doesn't only speak of health but speaks of well-being that notion of health as a resource for where people live, love, work and play. So how do they have a good life has really come to the fore. And I think health promotion as a discipline and as an approach has pushed that kind of thinking over the last 30, 35 years very strongly. Okay. So um, thank you. And um, so let us move to the pandemic, which also touches on what you've just mentioned. And um, I want to cast the light on the global south, which often looks to the global north for direction when it comes to handling um, global health uh, emergencies. So however, what we are seeing is that continents such as Africa so far have surpass some expectations in COVID-19 outcomes, considering the difficulties they face every day in their realities. So in your opinion, what lessons could the world learn from Africa, for example, or the global South in general in these times, as far as health promotion is concerned? Veronica, that's an incredibly important question, and I would actually challenge one of the sentences that you've used to say the Global South uh, looks to the Global North. Uh, I think it does less of that, and, uh, and I think that's important, and we're learning that, as you rightly said now during COVID-19. What's a key lesson from the Global South, from Ebola, from SARS, polio, tuberculosis, etc. We've learned about the importance of communities, of involving communities. And to some extent in the Global North, we have lost that understanding of how important communities are in actually addressing uh, health issues. Of course, in the Global North, we also lost uh, the relationship, the cultural understanding of an infectious disease. And uh, we have found that the experience of dealing with Ebola, the infrastructure that we have in uh, many countries of the Global South from polio eradication efforts, many of these things have contributed. And of course, one other factor is that Africa has a very, very young population. So also the distribution, of course, of uh, the uh, COVID-19 is quite different. At the same time, of course, and health inequalities message also in uh, health promotion, we are finding that uh, the fall into poverty of children, of young people, of women, of the population overall is uh, absolutely very, very worrying. And, uh, and here the Global North does come in, and that is how do we ensure common goods, how do we share resources, and to what extent is the Global North willing, for example, through debt relief, uh, through cancellation of debt, I would say, to help the countries of the Global South get through this crisis. Ilona, um, the Global Health community uh, recognizes your role in developing uh, the Global Health Diplomacy concept. And in addition to the pandemic, global challenges affecting health uh, includes the migration, tackling the determinants of non-communicable diseases, urbanization or cope with climate change, really upgraded the role of global health diplomacy. So how do you feel? Uh, what is the role of health promotion in this process? 
Well, Michele, from the start, health promotion has been about the determinants of health. In the charter, it's still called the prerequisites. Uh, the language uh, has changed. And I think it's very interesting and important to go back to the charter and actually see that it was the first uh, WHO document to actually speak of ecological challenges and to uh, create that synergy between an ecological movement and a health movement. It was also, you will remember because you were there in Ottawa, we had invited the representatives of the women's movement, recognizing that social movements play an incredibly important role in taking health forward and uh, in uh, expressing health promotion goals. So I think, first of all, you know, that focus on the determinants has actually been strengthened also through the Commission on Social Determinants of Health. But we've seen that, and this refers also to your question, we've seen that two other determinants are absolutely crit critical. One is what we now call the commercial determinants of health. That is the fact that within a consumer society, which is becoming globalized, our everyday lives are more and more defined by commercial goals, also in the digital sphere. And I'm very, very happy to see that there's so much more work on the commercial determinants. And then, of course, what we call the political determinants. And we're seeing that now very clearly. And again and again, we need to stress uh, this fact. Health is always about political choices and health is always also about power. And these power shifts have to be addressed by health promotion. Uh, thank you very much. And um, I, your point brings me to the question on um, digital uh, transformation when we speak of the impact of the commercial determinants in this space of the digital transformation and also when we just look in general how we see an increasing number of evolving partnerships to promote digital transformation um, we can say that the advancement of technology has been a positive contribution to surviving the current times However, for uh, global health, there has been a potential downside, which ha some have described as the infodemic. So what experience and lessons do you think we could take from health promotion, particularly in this era of, of uh, digital uh, transformation? Well, Veronica, first of all, I think that health promotion has to put a real priority on dealing with the digital transformation and its various aspects. And probably it's starting to be one of the determinants of health as well. It's something we have to explore in greater depth. And I've obviously, I've written also about the dark side of this digital transformation, how it actually gets uh, in the way of empowerment because of the surveillance components and because of what you said, uh, the infodemic, uh, the uh, information that cannot be trusted, etc. I think in health promotion, we have to bring together three literacies, the health literacy. And again, that is a movement that has gained a lot of strength. Uh, the digital literacy component of that. But what we forget, and that again is linked to empowerment, is what many people now call civic literacy. That is how we deal with each other, the democratic components of this. And I think health promotion is challenged to develop an approach that combines health literacy, digital literacy, and civic literacy. That will be one of the really important things and look at forms, as we do in public health also, of regulatory measures, health protection measures, and health promotive measures that we undertake in the course of the digital transformation. Ilona, uh, in these days uh, we see an increasing number of evolving 
partnerships in the field of uh, global health. And in the same time, um, global health is uh, increasingly on the agenda of major global meetings. And um, uh, could I ask that, how do you feel? Is there a risk that governmental and international commitments cut the ground from under the feet of NGOs and the actions of civil society at local level? And in the context of health promotion, what is the importance of civil society these days? Thank you, Mihaly. And I already referred to it at the beginning. A lot of the thinking on health promotion was informed by social movements, was informed by the understanding of empowerment and taking action, being a social actor. And we see that now. We see young people taking social action and uh, uh, pushing the environmental agenda. We have seen throughout the years a whole range of really, really critical health movements. And we see now, for example, the NCD movements and uh, the patient movements that uh, people say, you know, what is it like to live with a chronic disease? What is it like to live with tuberculosis? To give these diseases not just a medical face, but a human face and a social face. And that takes us back to the issue of power. You know that the fifth action area of the Ottawa Charter obviously was reorient health systems. And that has been one of the toughest things of all to actually involve patients, to include patients, to hear their voices, to give them power and to share power within the health system with patients and between the various health professionals. You know, we started uh, the health promoting hospitals and that was a project that tried to democratize the health system. And so just as we uh, push forward to uh, involve uh, communities in a variety of ways, we should try and see how that health system itself will become a democratic undertaking and then it will be healthier for everyone, those who have to enter it and those who have to work there. Okay. Um, uh, speaking of which, uh, Professor Klikush, we, um, we noticed that traditionally the focus on, on health promotion services has often centered on the recipients who are the general public, the communities and households. But uh, one thing that's um, come to light with regards to the health, different health system challenges that both the global north and the global south faces is this impact it has had on health workers and health service providers who are severely impacted due to the interactive nature of their work. So in that regard, um, what could health promotion play or the civil society play in addressing these uh, disparities among health workers and providers, both in the clinical settings, as uh, mentioned before, and also in the non-clinical settings? Well, Veronica, this is what health promotion tried to do with the settings approach. Uh, we said, you know, there are contexts in which health is created, where people live, love, work and play. That was taken up by the Commission on the Social Determinants of Health. And we said, you know, if we take a setting like a school, like a hospital, like an older person's home, etc., we have to look at it as an interactive dynamic system. And these systems can only be health promotive if uh, the working conditions are good, if the interaction and the, commun and the communication between uh, in th the pupils and the teachers, between involving the community and the parents, if we look at schools. And the same thing is true of, uh, of health systems, be they primary healthcare centers, be they hospitals, be they emergency centers. 
And we saw that in COVID-19, that uh, without an interface between the community and the health systems, without an understanding of when to go to the health systems and when to take care of yourself, and an understanding of taking care of others. I think you know a key health promotion thinking is that it's not just individual. It's not just about me. It's about all of us. And the Director General of WHO always speaks of solidarity. And in the early days of COVID, we experienced some of this solidarity of helping each other. And I think the health promotion thinking also tries to bring across, we have responsibility to some extent where we can influence it, not everyone can, for our own health. But more important is health solidarity, that we support each other, that we protect each other, and in terms of empowerment, that we fight for each other, that we have our right to health. Uh, thank you very much, Ilona. And uh, my last question uh, uh, brings us a little bit back uh, to the pandemic, but also uh, touches upon uh, the solidarity. Um, we see that during the pandemic, the health system performance is on the verge of being in many countries. Lockdown measures have led to economic downturns all exacerbated by geopolitical tensions. International solidarity has been questioned by the confinement of several nation states, the spread of nationalism and populism. So what do you think, what kind of role health promotion may play in this situation? Well, Michali, that of course is a big challenge and particularly a challenge uh, for politicians and uh, their commitment to multilateralism, their commitment to the World Health Organization. And uh, those commitments are of a different nature. They can be, you know, clear political commitments to support multilateralism. But they also need financial commitment. You know, we need 35 billion for COVAX to ensure that everyone in the world uh, gets vaccinated. So there are many of these solidarity movements that are going on. And actually, at present, we see two things at the same time. Some major players moving out of multilateralism but uh, a whole range of other actors, both states and civil society, and even private companies saying, we need this multilateral system, we need to protect it, we need to take it forward. So part of that also is reform, and therefore the role of civil society, for example, in terms of the reforms of the World Health Organization, the reforms of the international health regulations is very, very important. And again, you know, we come back to the right to health and many of the economic issues that need to be addressed, for example, in the G20, uh, in ensuring, as I mentioned before, uh, debt cancellation, uh, for example. So, but an important thing is that kind of action must not only happen at the international level, it must happen at the national level as well. It's important for civil society, but also for parliamentarians in particular, to give a message to governments. We want you to support the World Health Organization. We want you to support multilateralism. We want you to support global solidarity. And each and every single voice is important for that. Uh, so many thanks uh, for your insights, uh, Professor Kekush, which uh, demonstrate that health promotion indeed has a great responsibility in these critical periods. Um, in the 21st century, the scope for health promotion is uh, different clearly and than when the concept was born back in 1986. Mm -hmm. uh, but the spirit of a tower is indeed alive, uh, advocating, mediating, enabling role of health promotion 
is more important than ever. And without civil society, without the ownership of the people and the communities, uh, no progress indeed can be made. Thank you, Ilona, really very much for being with us and having this interview. Uh, really, we have enjoyed uh, very much talking uh, with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mihaly and Veronica. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much. Dear Bernard, dear Gabriella, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and friends, the world is learning the hard way. As we hold this 10th global forum, over 1 million people have lost their lives due to COVID-19. And there will be many more deaths that we will mourn. The pandemic originated from decisions in trade, the risks for public health were not considered. A health in all policies approach would have been able to prevent the steepest economic downturn that the world now faces since the Second World War. A public health response that is based on public health principles, which we have greatly contributed to through health promotion, now saves lives in those countries that follow them. Be first, be right, be credible, be empathetic. This is how you drive an epidemic response. We know what to do and how to do it. Dr. Tedros, WHO's Director General, also warned the world in early April. If you politicize an epidemic, you will see many more body bags. Those countries which have not listened now pay the bill. Colleagues, friends, we are now facing a new phase in the epidemic. Over the past months, we are seeing a decrease in people's compliance with public health measures. While most people complied in the first phase of the pandemic and during lockdown, many now take measures of physical distancing, hand hygiene, respiratory etiquette and disinfection at home less serious. Masks are often worn in inappropriate ways. In short, people are getting tired. In general, people's risk perception appear to have moved from the high alert crisis phase to a more relaxed, desensitized phase and thereby increasing the risk of transmission. This is alarming. Learning from the history of the Spanish flu pandemic, it was the third wave of infection that killed most people. In addition, we need to anticipate possible social behavior once a vaccine becomes available. This also bears a heightened risk of social disruption caused by, on the one hand, high demand and on the other, vaccine hesitancy or even resistance. Signs of this are already evident in the public and political domains across the world. While some people do not appreciate the prioritization of vaccination based on public health and ethical principles, others are influenced by the ever-growing anti-vaccine lobby. Finally, public health messaging in the 21st century is complex with the widespread access to internet and social media, as well as the general decline in trust in authorities and institutions. The public and communities are impacted by the infodemic that is accompanying the pandemic. It is difficult to distinguish between misinformation, disinformation, rumors and evidence-based knowledge. Knowledge operates in the complex ecosystem, but most of the knowledge that individuals, families and communities receive are from international or national sources. 
with little or no translation and transformation into their local realities. COVID-19 is a wake-up call for the world. We had received earlier ones, which we didn't hear. H5N1 15 years ago, H1N1 10 years ago, Ebola five years ago, and now COVID-19. Sure, there had been reviews after each of these epidemics. Very pertinent recommendations were made already in, already in 2011. The follow-up has been patchy. Countries evaluated their strengths and weaknesses. They found that the world was not well prepared for a next epidemic, and then they left it at that. In order to prevent a next pandemic, we need to make drastic, comprehensive changes in the way we shape our societies and how we incorporate health into decisions in different sectors. These epidemics have all had something to do with how we have driven forward urbanization, how we have increasingly restricted the distance between the animal world and us humans. As a result, viruses are being transferred from animals to humans. In addition, there are several other risks in the world that could lead to an epidemic or pandemic. If we do not get to grips with the causes of these, then there is a high probability of a next pandemic, which may be much worse. What can health promotion contribute so we will learn from this crisis? We have developed important instruments in health promotion since Ottawa, thus for almost 35 years. We can offer experience and develop healthy public policies, which now are perhaps called health in all policies or joined up government and multi-sectoral policy making that takes people's needs into account. Such approach, which has been developed by health promotion, has now also been, been called for by the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres and has just been adopted at the UN General Assembly. Our many years of experience in health promotion are now important for reshaping our societies in the aftermath of this crisis. It shows that decision makers, when applying health promotion instruments, know more precisely what the consequences of their actions will have on the public's health and can better reach a compromise and bring about value-driven trade-offs. And we have gathered experience how to apply health promotion instruments in the response of an epidemic. In the emergency response, we observed that without public participation, the acceptance of health professionals from outside was extremely low. In the Ebola response in the Democrat and Democratic Republic of Congo in 2018, we applied classic social engagement instruments with community health workers on site, and that led us to greater compliance. For example, when implementing quarantine measures. Co-designing public health measures by adapting international and national guidance to local realities is an important offer we make to our emergency response colleagues. Stakeholder participation is a way to increase ownership and thus compliance. Social engagement is a tool that it, uh, ensures that public health experts listen to the needs of the people. Empowerment mechanisms are instruments to ensure that people can and will express their views and take control over their health. We cannot rely on quick fixes. We now realize that it takes time before a vaccine can be developed and made available to the world. None of this can be done in the twinkling of an eye. The development of vaccines is an incredibly complex matter. The global community is just learning 
that this virus cannot be contained without involving people in the fight against it. It can neither be contained without community engagement and action, without stakeholder analysis, without health literacy, in other words, without the classic health promotion instruments. Epidemiologists provide the data and pre pre prepare quarantine measures. But for example, increasing compliance or acceptance for those measures or bringing together the various interests, these are tasks for health promotion. Let's take the conflicting proposals to get the economy moving again quickly or to get mobility, especially air travel, moving again quickly and weigh that up against the possible risks of a second and third wave of COVID-19. Bringing these interests together, communicating, interacting with different interest groups, these are all roles of health promotion for which it has developed suitable instruments. Health literacy is also part of it. For instance, that people know how to assess health risks correctly so that they can act responsibly. Colleagues, addressing risks to health is one side of health promotion. The other side is that where we create health and well-being. Let us look at this other side for a minute. Fundamentally, we can offer a new way how to foster development. Economic growth alone has proven not effective in terms of equity, universality, human rights and sustainability. Health will also not be able to unite different sectors with completely different agendas. In health promotion, we have learned to tune in with those other sectors, understand their interests and agendas. A health lens helps to identify common grounds with, which serves as basis for negotiating cross-sectoral policies. But many countries now show that well-being is a much better ground to meet and align agendas. Look at Scotland, New Zealand, Bhutan, or UAE. Fundamentally, these countries set out well-being goals and the different sectors need to show how they contribute to those if they want to receive additional shares of the budget. The OECD has developed a way how this development can be measured. Interestingly, this approach based on well-being yields positive economic impacts as well. In WHO, we are currently bringing the global knowledge on well-being together. It is about time we bring this side of health promotion more to the forefront for development. We will focus on well-being as the theme for the 10th Global Conference on Health Promotion, with which we want to celebrate 35 years of Ottawa. I thank you. Videos of Dr. Gabriel Zeus, Ilona Kickbush, and Dr. Rudiker Krak. We will now turn to Mihaly Kokini for a comment uh, as one of the interviewers of Dr. Kickbush. Mihaly. Thank you, Wendy. Good morning to everyone. So, the statements from Professor Kickbush were really convincing in the sense that it is worthwhile and necessary to carry forward the spirit and the basic concepts of the Ottawa Charter. 34 years ago, it seemed relatively easy to answer where health is created and what depends on making healthy choice the easier one. Today, Due to the positive and negative effects of globalization, health promotion faces a more inextricable environment. 
As Ulrich Back explained, we live in a global risk society defined by the accumulation of risks, ecological, pandemic, financial, social, military, biochemical, and so on. And all of which are interconnected and feed off each other. Successful health advocacy presupposes the understanding of social and political dynamics and transformation of our age. Health promotion in this context can make it clear that overcoming COVID requires a public health strategy that includes the combination of the social determinants approach with the commitment to individual and community empowerment. Lockdowns, the future vaccine is worth nothing if people don't grasp the meaning of these tools. Health promotion can and must do a lot in achieving that countries follow an inclusive pandemic management policy that leaves no one behind. And finally, all this is not an end in itself. As Rüdiger said, well-being is now on the agenda of the 10th Global Conference on Health Promotion planned after the pandemic, not just as a long-term abstract target model. So the lesson of COVID is that, that the deterioration of living conditions, the insecurity values the concept of well-being and people now want more concrete answer to make it closer. And health promotion is expected to proceed on this track. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mihaili. And to our audience, I would like to invite all of you to please indicate questions that you may have uh, for the speakers we do have. While you're doing so, I'll kick off a question to Dr. Krach, uh, wondering, based on the current conditions and the opportunities for collaboration, also based on the wider scope for participation as indicated in dialogues around One Health and also the enhanced participation of the Southern Hemisphere in our North-South dialogues. Uh, can you give some specifics around the kind of consultation and engagement you're looking for at the WHO to inform both pandemic planning and health promotion planning in the future? Yeah, thank you, very, Wendy, and uh, very good morning, good day, good evening to all. Um, Wendy, I think that's an incredibly important question because as I've outlined, it's all about co-design. It's about uh, listening to stakeholders and um, making the voices heard for the needs um, in, in order to be able also to then translate uh, the um, international and national guidance uh, into the local communities. And that's what we are trying to do at WHO in uh, fostering um, the pandemic um, uh, or fostering that co-design in the pandemic response. Um, so when it actually uh, comes to um, the other international organizations, when we come up with uh, recommendations for schools, for instance, to stay open and how that can be done because that's a that's an incredibly important um, area that we do not want to see another lockdown uh, now for schools. But that means that um, the guidance, the recommendations need to be translated into every single school. That's why we have worked with our colleagues from UNICEF, um, uh, but also then with the ministries of education and health to actually the networks that we've uh, now make uh, incredible use of, like the, the global networks of health promoting schools, uh, down to the individual school uh, teachers, uh, uh, parents, uh, students, and those people working at the school, to look how from the, the global, the international, uh, guidance, you actually translate the things down to your own school environment. And that has shown to work. Um, uh, so this 
to have this long path, if you would say, to govern from the individual school up to the to the global level. But it has worked um, now in when we um, when when schools reopened again, those who participated in this um, in this effort. Uh, but at the same time, also. Um, when it now is considered whether to again lock down schools or keep them open. Thank you very much. And I would like to offer uh, Bernard Kadazia, uh, President, Chair of the Alliance for Health Promotion, an opportunity to respond from the Southern Hemisphere around the Alliance's capacity to assist with that engagement. And um, then I'm very much looking forward to our next session. We'll close following this answer. Thank you very much, all. Well, thank you, Wendy. First, let me start by saying that it's really very encouraging when you see and hear what uh, the Director General, uh, Dr. Tedros, as well as uh, what Dr. Kresh from the World Health Organization um, really have shared with us uh, today. It is encouraging because uh, first I see that uh, uh, they really bring um, an analytical uh, viewpoint from the recent experience of the epidemic, tragic as it has been, uh, it is quite clear that uh, there are some lessons we can learn from. Some are lessons, new lessons, others are reinforcements uh, of what uh, uh, we used to try to think, to believe, uh, try to do. So I just want to say that this is very encouraging and, and particularly where you mentioned or where they mentioned the need for consultation, the need for uh, empowering communities, the need for empowering individuals and then the need for solidarity. And, and uh, I, I really liked uh, uh, the, the, the statement from Dr. Chris about co-designing and so that uh, there is a participatory approach, both in identifying problems, but also in seeking to solve them. But overall, I'm very uh, encouraged by uh, the uh, reinforcement around public health once more and also uh, about uh, uh, reinforcement of the concept, the discipline, uh, even the mindset of uh, health promotion. I just want to say we as civil society would really like to pick these signals and, and to work with the WHO to really uh, get a, a combined and mutual impact uh, overall. Thank you very much, Bernard. Thank you to all the participants on this panel. Please stay with us for our next session on organizing civil society for impactful health promotion. Um, I want to thank all of you and invite you to continue to engage through the forum component of the app for the conference where you can register key messages that we will be using and sharing more on that with you at noon uh, in development of a consensus statement going forward after the conference we take up your invitation to consult and engage and co-design with you and we're looking very much forward not only with the members of the panel but with our wider world health audience in preparing for a future in which health promotion is a cohesive and solidarity based activity across the world in response to pandemic and for the horizon. Thank you all and best wishes.